Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's lunch briefing. For those of you who've come to our lunch briefings before, welcome back. If it's your first time, welcome. I'll explain the format. We're going to have a half hour presentation from our Professor Susanna Hecht, and then we'll have half an hour for conversation, questions and answers. So while Susanna is giving her presentation, think about questions that you would like to ask, and we'll try and squeeze as many in, and we'll finish at 1.30. Susanna Hecht is Professor of Environmental History, the Graduate Institute. She joined us last year. And she's also the co-director of our Center for International Environmental Research. She divides her time between Geneva and California. She spends the autumn semester here. And then in the spring, she teaches at UCLA's Luskin, Luskin School of Public Policy. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Susanna for her presentation. Well, I'm delighted to be here. Now, if I can just get the things going here. Um, it was really a panic to get this together. I mean, not in the sense of um, throwing it together quickly, but rather in the sense that the last six weeks have been a time of unprecedented um, environmental catastrophes stimulated or enhanced or ramified through processes of climate change. So part of this has been just actually sort of sitting down and looking at this material. And then the other thing is sitting around and um, organizing the, uh, the um, hold on, let's see, go forward. Here we go. Um, I'm just checking how my system works here. And looking at the kinds of things that are going on. Um, uh, Strain, although I'm knocking on wood, uh, so far Southern California hasn't had too much, but Northern California, as you know, is under a devastation. Um, if you have been following this, you'll also know that Portugal has something like 523 fires going at this moment, and that um, we also, also are seeing Ireland being buffeted by and then the ex-hurricane Ophelia, but Ophelia, of course, stayed as a Category 3 um, hurricane well further north than usual. This is partly due to the warming of the oceans. The oceans around the equator now sort of war clock in at 83 degrees Fahrenheit. That's sort of like a very heated swimming pool or a, um, you know, or a, um, a, a hot tub. So it's very important to understand that these, this warming ocean is a reflection in part of climate change. But what you can see, of course, is that this devastation is not, uh, is not trivial. And also, I think what you can see with this also is the magnitude of the size of these storms. That is, these are not what used to be rather sort of m more petite little storms, but very intense for storms that cover uh, hundreds of kilometers. Um, there, the storms are one thing, but there's also the other thing about vulnerabilities. And I think one of the things that we forget in these stories, you look and you see these incredible images, thanks to the NOAA satellites, which will probably be un unfunded under Mr. Bush. But there are these extraordinary vulnerabilities which have to do with the forms of development that occur without taking climate questions into account, or rather other ones that have a, a different dynamic to them, a different, if we will, uh, a, 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 a political ecology or economic ecology. So if, now, I know that there are many among you who cheer the um, screw trap wine bottle. I myself would count myself among them. But uh, one of the things that has happened as a consequence is that demand for cork has declined. So these rather beautiful cork forests that were considered to be legacy landscapes um, and uh, you know this sort of strange deal where you have a sort of stripped, stripped uh, trunk here um, has been uh, replaced actually by a landscape that's largely uh, composed of pines and eucalyptus for pulp. So in part, um, one of the things that has been a consequence of that is the change over from a, a fire-tolerant um, heritage landscape like this um, into a different kind of landscape that looks like this, whoop, um, which is this dense, uh, dense pines, uh, used uh, single-aged, used for um, 
used for uh, pulp for the most part, coupled with Mediterranean climate drought means that these become very flammable landscapes. Another uh, uh, vulnerable, this is the California oak forest, and I think you can see the, the similarities between the two, um, is that this also was managed with low intensity fires, without these crown fires, but California also has had a drought, and um, the upshot here is the end of wood that this were a Trump hotel. Um, uh, <laughs> not the Hiltons, but the transformation of these landscapes from uh, pine, um, which is very vulnerable to drought, and in our case we have had the, the dynamics of um, pine forests, drought, and attack by the pine bark beetle, which then essentially um, uh, uh, makes these trees, it either kills them, There's, we've had a mortality of about 60 million pine trees, so that's another reason these things are going up like hell. Um, but also that with the expansion of urban areas into the, um, uh, the, at the urban wildland interface, people like to plant pines and they like to plant eucalyptus because they grow very quickly and then you get that sort of foresty thing, but it's also hyper flammable. Um, so not only do we have fire, but we also have water. And this is just simply uh, the storm surge map for Houston. And what you can see here is how devastating this is. And particularly since you've had a lot of development that has been at the expense of wetlands in, in places like Houston and virtually no um, environmental controls over the, uh, over the form of sprawl. So essentially you have covered these landscapes with non-permeable surfaces. They're low-lying anyway, they're sinking and the sea is rising, and you've gotten rid of all the buffers in terms of wetland dynamics. So it's important to keep in mind that the vulnerabilities have changed a lot. Now, I'm going to talk mostly about the United States here uh, because I'm talking about Trump policy, but one of the things that you could certainly see in the dynamics of change is the decline in U.S. emissions over the last decade or so. Um, and the point about this is that it may be slow, but it's certainly occurring, and also that the energy intensity is increasing. That means you're getting more bang for the buck of energy, which is quite useful. Again, it's slower than you might like, but there has been a big transition into um, uh, other kinds of fuels, and particularly renewables. We'll stay here for just a moment in the uh, fossil fuels. And um, what you can see here is coal is not competitive under market conditions at this juncture. Uh, we've had a rise in natural gas, of course, which is um, it burns cleaner than coal when you combust it. But you'll see when we go over the policies that one of the big problems with it is methane. Remember that Dick Cheney, um, uh, George Bush's uh, vice president, basically inaugurated the fracking boom of which nat this natural gas is a consequence. Um, but, and, uh, as a co and also he did so. So this is a relatively new, um, a, a new form of energy in the system and one that was very, mostly unregulated until quite recently because it's so young. And the result has been, of course, that these uh, controls on it are now being undone. The other thing is that, of course, uh, alternative fuels are becoming much, much cheaper. So in some sense, you would expect, given the market dynamics of fossil fuels, the, 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 use, the decline in the price of solar, um, and the importance of renewables as a general source, and thinking about your construction your urban infrastructure, your rural infrastructure as being related to non-renewable -re resources, you can sort of think about how that might pan out. Now, I, I always refer to the breakaway Republic of California when I'm in, um, so that I'm not overly identified with the reactionary environmental politics currently on offer um, elsewhere in the United States. But we have had a very, uh, active uh, energy policy. I'm part of what's called the Nifty 50. I work on mostly on vegetation and mostly in the tropics, but um, there's, it's a virtual think 
tank um, uh, organized by the, uh, the president, Napolitano, who used to be Homeland Security um, uh, director, uh, and it basically works on um, coming up with uh, uh, forward environmental policy for California, particularly in the energy sector. So uh, we have some publications, and we'll make sure that some of these things get on to our site so that you can look at them later in the day. There's no point in going, I don't have enough time to amble through them. But the point is that looking at renewables, you really can get a major global economy, the California economy, depending on who's counting, is either fifth or eighth in the world. It produces about 3% of the global greenhouse gas gases, and it does so in a context of uh, environmental regulations and um, uh, 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 socially inclusive politics. So um, it's important to keep that in mind given the general uh, discourses that un, uh, uh, run through the thing. Now, um, I had the unhappy exercise this morning of going, well, like who's, <laughs> who in the cabinet is a climate denier? And actually, it was rather distressing to find that most of them were. And if they don't, when they were being confirmed, they used to sort of uh, wiggle around and say, well, actually, we're really a climate skeptic, um, and come up with unusual things. But then in their actions, they have behaved, and in their subsequent uh, discussions, have been, re revealed their, their colors as climate deniers, or if not outright deniers, certainly uh, very high on the skepticism front. So at the first level, of course, you have Trump and Pence, who both are climate deniers and who feel this is a, 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 a lie put about by in order to damage the US. You have the EPA director, Scott Pruitt. You have Interior, um, Mr. Zinke. You have the Department of Energy. Mr. Uh, Rick Perry, the Secretary of State, Rex Tillerson, who used to be head of Exxon. Exxon is under a bunch of lawsuits for having done research that indicated that there was human-caused climate change and then repressed this information. Um, health um, and urban development is, uh, or uh, housing and urban development is Ben Carson, a highly religious man who doesn't believe that um, uh, that there could, you know, that this is really a human thing. The CIA, of course, uh, Mike Pompeo, who may be moving into some other position, like, for example, if Rex Tillerson gets kicked out, um, also is not a believer. Um, uh, or let's say is they, they, a lot of them have a lot of evangelical uh, ideologies as part of their intellectual formation and political concerns. Uh, Health and Human Services uh, Director Tom Price um, uh, has been involved with the Koch, Koch Brothers uh, um, uh, institutions in many ways and has taken the Koch Brother pledges to oppose any climate legislation. Um, commer commerce, um, which is under under which NOAA is, which has been um, and the potential budgets has been vastly underfunded. Um, has a long history of investing in um, um, in uh, gas and oil companies, so we could imagine that he is not particularly in favor of climate regulations. And then Attorney Jeff Se uh, Sessions always argues that CO2 is a plant food. It's really good for the planet to have more CO2. And uh, even as we speak, every breath you take is uh, you're breathing out CO2. So there's a little problem, let's say a conceptualization problem. But so this is the administration. And um, what's important to realize about this is that this is the top tier, but the secondary and tertiary tiers, insofar as they have been occupied, are also very um, awash in climate denialism. Um, so what does that mean? Um, I'm, uh, th there, there are many reasons for this. I'm not going to go over it too much, but to just point out that we have very powerful financial forces that are not interested in regulating uh, fossil fuels or having climate, uh, climate policy as an active thing. Um, Thomas Mann, not that Thomas Mann, but, uh, and Norm Ornstein, uh, two people associated with the not very radical 
Heritage Foundation have described this current administration as a tachyocracy, a term that was used in the 18th century, not just invented, although it has a certain relevance, um, which is basically ruled by the most venal and incompetent, which seems to be more or less what we see under at this time. Um, Anyway, uh, let's go forward and see what's going on. So these kinds of images must be very uh, common for you now to, uh, you're, we're all accustomed now to seeing these on our phones. But what is as important is that I'm always sort of reminded of the old Paul Simon song, there must be 50 ways to leave your lover. Um, there's now uh, more than 50 ways to ruin the climate. Um, and if you really want to hang out and have some fun, you can sort of make up verses for that, in a, you know, but I would get that screw top, but well, maybe get one with cork and, you know, a little later on you might find it. Um, so there are several that have been overturned. I'm going to just give you like the one minute, let's see if I can get these, um, the one minute, um, less than one minute, because I don't have the one minute for each of these, but um, the, many of these were put into place by the Obama uh, administration, and so there's a kind of reflexive anti-Obamism in some of this. But building for uh, flood standards is one. Um, the, uh, the, the freeze on new coal leases in public lands has been lifted, so that means that you can take uh, coal out of uh, BLM and national forests. The methane reporting requirement has also been uh, alleviated, and this is important because of the importance of, of fracking as the energy source um, for that is gradually replacing coal. Uh, methane, as you know, is a, is a, um, a highly active uh, greenhouse gas. It, it's what's often called a greenhouse gas pollutant. It um, is 80 times more powerful than CO2, but its life in the system is about 15 years, which is why it's called a pollutant, uh, as opposed to CO2 that has a long, uh, a much longer life. Um, so one of the things that is easy, relatively easy to get at and important to get at is these greenhouse gas pollutants in which uh, certainly methane and methane porting uh, is, is, is reporting for regulating it is important. Um, the anti-dumping rule for coal companies basically refers to what you can do with the slag after you, you deal with it. The um, uh, Keystone XL pipeline, although it's still in the courts, was overruled. And the reason it was overruled is because um, it involves coal oil shale um, uh, from Canada being the, the slag being transform, uh, transformed and transported through most of the United States to uh, basically Houston for export, but in the process um, having um, uh, the potential for a number of leaks, particularly affecting the Ogallala watershed, which is the major uh, one of the major watersheds in, in the central United States. Um, there's an offshore drilling ban in the Atlantic and Arctic that has been overturned. So uh, what that means is that these more vulnerable and uh, urban, er uh, vulnerable coastal areas and vulnerable wildlands areas are now um, able to be uh, um, uh, bid on. Um, the seismic air gun testing really is about what they do is they use them to sort of ascertain the size and a location of oil things, but they really uh, ups uh, upset wildlife, such as whales. So whale lovers have been very upset about this, but it's over for them. Those whales, they're from another, they're from the, they're from the old Pleistocene, so tough. We're in the Anthropocene now. Um, the other is, of course, uh, the Bering Sea Climate Resilience Plan. This is an area where, of course, the, the Arctic and the tropics are the places that are most uh, at risk in terms of climate change. So one of the things that's happening, of course, is you have a lot of sea level rise, you have a lot of sea changes, you have melting permafrost and so on. So for populations that, in, that live there, this resilience plan was a way to address and adapt to the inevitable changes associated with climate modification. 
Royalty regulations for oil, gas, gas and coal, well, you'll be amazed to hear that limits on that have been um, taken up. Um, the other thing was looking, as part of the environmental impact reviews, looking at the impact of, of activities in, that affect environment on greenhouse gas emissions. So that's no longer a requirement. And also using uh, environmental and greenhouse gas emissions as, um, as part of the uh, assessment in uh, new ruling for new um, infrastructure projects. So when people say, hey, there's no, he doesn't really have a plan, I, I really beg to differ with you because as you can see, and we're not done yet, I've got, oop, I'm slapping this thing around. I have many more to go. Um, but uh, what you can see is that there's a very strong and perhaps more comprehensive um, attack on environmental laws and particularly climate-based uh, issues than almost any other, um, any other kind of area. Um, so mining restrictions in Bristol Bay. Um, I have a few, I'll have a few words to say about um, the lifting of hunting restrictions on big game. Uh, Don Jr., as uh, you may or may not know, is a big, is a big game hunter. So, um, <laughs> you know, have at it, I suppose. Um, the other thing is like one of these really things where you go, why would they even bother? But apparently someone from the National Plastic Bottle or bottle association said, you know, one of the things is we can't sell these in national parks anymore because they are, they, people throw them around, they, they litter. And so if, while they had the ban, it was great because the parks were cleaned up and the, this, the, it looked a lot better. But that's over now. Um, so um, also to think about national parks in terms of the development and their management in terms of their impacts on climate. This is important in terms of both getting the negative emissions of um, uh, CO2 uptake on the part of forest management and also questions about how to manage in light of these fire hazards that we now see which also generate massive amounts of CO2 and soot and other things into the atmosphere. Um, all federal projects used to have a climate mitigation element to them. That is, if they were going to crank out CO2 or other kinds of greenhouse gas pollutants of many kinds, they had to have a mitigation plan. So they had to have a way to offset the pollution that they were generating and the, uh, CO the climate effects of what they were doing. That's now been lifted. The other thing was using within um, federal project things the social cost of carbon. So uh, if you, uh, we will be hearing soon what the, um, the uh, 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 insurers have to say about the costs of this year's fires and, uh, and the hurricanes, but it looks to be in the hundreds of billions of dollars. Um, so that is, after all, a social cost. So if we're starting to look and if we can start to see, as climate modelers will tell us, many more intense storms associated with a warming climate, um, this question of the social cost of carbon and thinking about the uh, costs of climate change within projects becomes important. Um, and this, of course, is part of the planning rule for public lands. Um, and then copper as a, as a hazardous waste, that's not exactly relevant to this. Um, let's see, there are rollbacks. And they are specifically now, um, they can't be, these are things that cannot be done instantly. They have to go through the courts, they have to go through uh, a certain amount of review, but in essence, um, the U.S. And has backed away from these. In the case of the U.S. itself, it's the Clean Power Plan, which was basically to shift um, the energy grid away from coal um, and toward renewables, as, but as um, Mr. Pruitt just said in rolling this back, um, uh, the war against coal is over. I urge you to remember that the n amount of employment in coal is roughly equivalent to um, a, it's, there's a, there's a, um, 
a, a store, a, a chain store, which doesn't have many people <laughs> involved in it, called Bed Bath and Beyond, which sells linens and towels and scented candles. And basically, the uh, coal industry has the same number of employees as that. So we're looking at less than 170,000 employees in a giant economy. Uh, the Paris Agreement, the climate agreement, as you know, is also over. Um, the wetland and tributary protections become more and more important now because of the role of these areas and their environmental services in mitigating things like um, flood, flooding and um, uh, surges at with, so getting rid of those is, uh, and those uh, protections is especially complicated. And because wetlands are often on coastal areas, um, these have often blocked development in areas that are quite vulnerable. Um, they're taking these away means that that great coastal development can go forward, but also at, uh, in, in ever more risky contexts. Um, Car and truck efficiency, fuel efficiency standards, I think what we're seeing is a, a, a reactionary presence. People have been loving that they could have cars that were more fuel efficient because they were cheaper to run. The status of 10 national monuments is important because of the drilling and mining associated with them. Before, you couldn't do anything on those particularly the ones in Utah that perhaps you saw this, the Bears Ears Monument, which is sacred land to indigenous populations there. They didn't dare get rid of any uh, national monuments in California because the public commentary was so vituperative that they didn't dare, but they certainly did elsewhere. Um, the marine areas are important a lot because not only does it protect fisheries, but also because there are many areas that are kelp forests, and kelp forests are probably the most efficient um, uh, CO2 um, uh, munchers on the planet. They're really good. Um, the other thing is limits on toxic, toxic uh, discharge from power plants. So that means mercury and things like that no longer are going to be regulated. Um, this goes along also with coal ash discharge regulations. So you can start to see that instead of having a lot of excellent clean air, we will now see a lot more um, um, uh, power plant discharges, and many of these are not in remote areas. Many of these are actually in cities, so that the public health effects of these are quite considerable. Um, a changing of emission standards for new, modified, or reconstructed power plants. You don't need to go up to what had been the current level. And new, there are new emission rules, uh, uh, rollbacks for power plants startup and shutdown. What this means is that um, archaic, um, archaic um, plants don't actually have to upgrade. That is, they can still keep operating in um, a less than perfect ways. I personally love this slide since it has golf. <laughs> it's sort of like fiddling while Rome burns. Um, it's uh, uh, but fiddling while nature burns. Um, or golfing, and uh, given, given the, the adoration of golfing by some residents of the White House, um, this sort of seems to be a kind of um, iconic slide in many ways. Um, say, basically, uh, fracking regulations are being reduced for public lands. It, you really didn't used to be able to frack on public lands, and now you'll be able to. Um, it used to be that you couldn't um, uh, drill for oil and gas in some national parks. Those, those uh, are being um, uh, uh, basically rolled back or in, uh, under, under, um, in, in legal limbo. Oil rig safety regulations, well, you know, um, those are also being undermined. Um, Regulations on offshore drilling are being removed to some degree. Again, these are moments where there's a lot of contestation within the courts and within um, various legislatures, and also the federal government can't do everything. That is, local states have some kinds of things. Um, the exploratory drilling in the Arctic Wildlife Refuge has been a source of controversy for the last 40 years. Um, so now this is now essentially going forward. In terms of hunting methods in Alaska, though, those of you here who are big game hunters, you can look forward to using high um, potency rifles and doing it from a helicopter. What could be more masculine? <laughs>
Um, so then, um, the thing about tracking emissions on federal highways and emission standards for trailers. So there's a lot of emission standards in the transportation sector that are currently in, um, in, uh, in limbo. And let's see, let's see, rollbacks, rollbacks. Oh, here's some more. <laughs> just keeps going on. Um, as I say, there are more, and, and this doesn't even discuss what is going on within the budget at this juncture. This is just pieces of legislation of which we have just gone through 82, or 52, excuse me. Um, these are quest in questions. Uh, again, a lot of these have to do with methane emissions, which was of particular concern because there's technologies to control it. It's a high greenhouse gas pollutant. And um, you, it, the, the technology is there to manage it, so there's no reason why you shouldn't be able to take this on, except that it is associated with um, fracking, fracking at site. So methane emissions uh, limits are being questioned. Limits on landfill emissions, um, this is important because actually you can capture that at landfills and use it as an energy source. Methane it can be burned for energy. So, um, and in many places, in fact, it becomes sort of a, yeah, a closed cycle of um, energy use there. Um, and then limits of methane emissions on public lands. If you are fracking or, or using oil leases on public lands, um, these are questions about methane. So methane was a really important point of control. This is, <laughs> go away. Um, a point of control in, um, in the Obama administration because actually the technology is very well developed and it's a super greenhouse gas. So it would be one of those things where you could get a, uh, quite a bit of bang for the buck without too much, um, uh, without having to, you know, invent uh, some uh, new technologies. Um, the mercury emissions for power plants, of course, is one of the other problems that we see. Um, and then also rolling back um, hazardous chemical facility regulations. You might have seen the explosions in, um, in, um, in Houston with these chemical facilities that could not be maintained without, um, without electricity. So these now become quite uh, a bit more um, problematic. Uh, ground protections for uranium mines. You would think that this would be uh, a, something that would be a nice thing to not have water, <laughs> groundwater contamination with uranium, but um, apparently the energy sector feels that since this occurs in remote, mostly um, uh, non-urban um, non and uh, indigenous lands, that groundwater protections are um, not really necessary. Efficiency standards for buildings. Um, again, this might seem like nothing, but the federal, the federal, um, the federal uh, system operates a lot of buildings. So it just means that wherever you can, you, do, you make for more efficient building, you put in solar panels and so on, so that in essence it acts as a demonstration effect and also as a support for alternative energy and more energy um, efficient building materials. And then uh, a rule helping consumers, by, uh, you know, and then there's somewhere where basically um, the, things like uh, power wise uh, dishwashers and so on were taken off of their regulatory thing. Well, so and at the big level, uh, this, this last week, the most important thing was the rolling back of the clean power plan. Again, you can't get out of these things instantly, but it basically was a, a, the idea of moving away from coal and moving on to more renewables, and a, a trend which, by the way, market forces had been doing in any case. So you had seen renewables going forward. Um, in, in many, uh, outcompeting it. In essence, what this does is it has also raised subsidies again on coal um, and taken them off the, um, the, uh, clean, uh, the cleaner energies. I think as part of um, some spat <laughs> with uh, China, uh, what we'll see also is uh, high tariffs on solar panels, uh, which will then, of course, change the economics somewhat. Um, but it's very important to understand this as a, I mean, you can't just dismantle this. 
because, but it is one of these things that's certainly in the target. And as I, as I mentioned, Mr. Pruitt said the war on coal is over. Um, but the capacity of coal is, and its viability is still in question. Um, with the Paris Accords, of course, uh, there's, you know, this was America first. As with every deal that was ever made prior to him, um, it was the worst deal ever, only exceeded by the worst deal of NAFTA, only exceeded by the worst deal of the TPP, only exceeded by the worst deal with Iran. We could just go on about the worst deal in history. Every one of them has been the worst deal. Uh, but the Paris Accord was viewed as being especially unfavorable to the United States, even though with the, the U.S. is actually lowering its CO2 emissions and so on. Um, but um, these questions, remember, we're not in a fact-based uh, system at this juncture. So the other problem about the Paris Accords is that it ramifies in other ways through things like the more general problem of global leadership on climate, with, where the U.S. had an important role to play and had been playing this. Um, also, in terms of science, I think we could argue that very convincingly that the U.S. had the sort of premier climate science modelers and analysts um, on tap, which was why the sort of turning the massive ship of uh, the United States into a climate, um, a, a climate uh, a reasonable state was a very important thing to do, but also that the questions of mitigation, the rule of uh, the, um, the, not the rule, but the importance of scientific um, advice and scientific activities as part of policy had been a very important feature of the Obama administration. Uh, it's important to realize now that the, um, the, the president's advisor, science advisor post is vacant. The last one was occupied by a Nobel laureate. So um, the other thing was to be thinking about mitigation and adaptation because certainly these, it's not going to be as nice a climate as it was, and also issues of climate justice, which are not just in the United States, but that the impacts of various kinds of uses, because they're planetary, affect other people, as opposed to the America First, which I think is the policy of just us, if you're an American. Um, and then um, finally, um, uh, endangered animals are moving into new categories. So some of you who worry about endangered animals um, because they're beautiful and interesting will find that they are um, now having their uh, protections removed. This is, of course, Don Jr. with a, a, a leopard. Um, but also that top predators are very important in ma maintaining the health of ecosystems, particularly as they undergo changes. So if you take out the top predators, you change these ecological dynamics, which are also important. And as I mentioned, there's a lot of hunting. Um, you can now hunt wolves. You can now hunt grizzly bears and so on. So endangered species acts are now um, uh, important. And also, there was a recent law that I happened to run across in some in some thing that I read, which was that actually the movement, the site's movement of in, this pelts of endangered species and so on, is likely to be lightened so that people can bring their trophies home, uh, as opposed to that being you know the sportsman thing, as opposed to the pelts for fashion. Um, so anyway, there's that. But the other thing, um, just because there's the it's this week, um, there's the Iran deal and there's the constant um, uproar about, um, about um, uh, 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 Korea. Um, it's important, <laughs> we could just have something completely different than what we thought we were worrying about, which is nuclear winter. Um, so anyway, uh, I don't mean to end on a facetious note because this is actually a very serious thing. Um, and uh, it's nuclear winter studies, actually, were sort of the prototype for understanding the dynamics of climate change. Um, and so finally, um, I don't like to put the end because it seems a little, you know, dour, but um, 
I think we have a lot of rethinking to do in the future, but right now we're looking at a really serious rollback on environment and climate in the United States, which has a lot of implications because of its importance globally as a producer of um, cl uh, climate changing greenhouse uh, gases and greenhouse pollutants. So on that note, I'll end. <laughs> Well, thanks so much for that feel-good presentation, Susanna. Um, we've, got, we've got about 20, 20 minutes for questions, so if you would like to question, put up a question, just put up your hand, um, and we'll bring the microphone around as many of you as possible. There's a gentleman in a red jumper um, waiting. Um, Susanna, maybe I could just seize the opportunity to ask a first question. Um, you, you talk about this pretty serious rollback that's going on. Is there anything that could derail it? short of impeachment? Well, there, there's a lot of, uh, the, oops, excuse me. The, the legal systems are um, in, high, in, in high action. So one of the things is that there's a lot of environmental lawsuits going on. And these are not just brought by, you might say, the NRDC or other kinds of things. They're actually being brought by community groups and so on, particularly in these um, power plant you know, taking all the pollution regulations off of them, you know, has really very serious environmental justice and health implications for local communities. So you're getting those kinds of things. The states are also doing quite a bit um, to block these kinds of things. And also there's the, um, the states themselves and, and cities, and cities have the largest uh, CO2 footprint, really. Um, are actively joining my city of Los Angeles when the the Paris Accord was um, denied by President Trump said, but wait, we're Los Angeles, we're still in. And uh, Jerry Brown said, yes, California is still in these in the Paris Agreement. So you have these sort of cross urban areas um, that are are engaged in these um, in 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 compliance with the uh, CO2 um, and the Paris Accord agreements. And then the other thing is these are also global cities. So if you start to look at it, you start to see 60 to 70% of the places where the GDP is generated in the US are actually in, want to stay in compliance. And actually people would prefer to have clean air and clean water as a general rule, not to be uh, sucking in mercury and coal ash. I mean, <laughs> to each his own, I suppose, but... Okay, great. Let's have the question, yeah. Uh, hello, uh, thank you for the presentation. I had a question. Uh, I've seen that in the Department of Energy, the Department of Energy uh, issued a communication regarding the CO2 emission, uh, the forecast for the CO2 emission for the US in 2018. And after, we have seen that in the recent years, CO2 emissions have uh, declined. In 2018, it said uh, it's 1.8 will be 1.8 percent more. Yeah. How is it based fact from the Department of Energy? Given that, however, we have seen that there are some states which are uh, against the new environmental policy by, from the Trump administration. There are the cities who, which uh, have uh, promised that they will uh, continue to complain with the Paris Agreement. So, how did they do this calculation, and why, if CO2 is no longer a, a concern for them, why are they keeping track of CO2? It, means it just seems like a contradiction. Well, I, I think the, uh, Mr. Bannon would say it's the deep state the bad deep state that's still keeping track of CO2 emissions. Remember that the term climate change has been expunged from almost all um, um, federal websites. So this means that, you know, even though there's resistance to this, um, uh, there isn't any belief in the, in the concept of climate change as a general th rule. Uh, in terms of why they're keeping track, I would say that it's iner it would have more to do with inertia. They already have a lot of um, CO2 tracking things in place. So what you're seeing with this rapid up uptick is how um, uh, vulnerable um, small gains are to changes in policy and changes in institutions. So this is a sort of um, 
this is a kind of an object lesson about how uh, necessary the constant pressure to reduce this stuff is and why actually even though at this junk juncture and perhaps the, uh, the leaving you know having a big snit over the over the Paris Accords is what it does is it changes the norms and it changes the political context which makes having a rise in CO2 sort of a matter of indifference but that they monitor it is a function of the fact that there's a lot of monitoring apparatuses. And you can also monitor it from space. Mm -hmm. Okay, next question. If you can, yeah, in the middle there. Thank you very much. Uh, why do you think instead of uh, investing heavily in climate denial discourse, the coal and oil industry cannot actually realize that there is an opportunity for them right now to invest in renewable energy resources because they are the capital owners now and because oil will be extinct in the you know upcoming future soon? Well, actually, I, I mean, <laughs> what I always think about the oil industry is it's a dinosaur industry anyway, both literally and figuratively. Um, you may recall that when uh, Trump exited the, um, the climate accords that his business panel basically resigned en masse. Um, there were many sort of advisory panels that just said, you know what, this is, this is stupid. Um, you, your, your, your cohorts may have been funded by the Koch brothers or by the fossil fuel industries, but the future is really elsewhere. So the, the point is that they have power now. I'm not sure they will have uh, power forever. And the other thing is that, but you know, it, it, they can do a lot of damage in the interim. But again, it's not like people have you know, like some horrible feel, bad feeling about solar energy or that they hate wind or hydropower, how despicable. Um, it's not that they have, uh, you know, uh, um, bad feelings about that. In fact, they're in favor of renewables if you look at the polling. It's that we have this kind of structural rigidity right now that's a function of how this Congress was elected and who this president chose to put into place. Um, so there, what we have is a kind of a structural, a structural problem which has to do with a less democratic um, uh, and pol politics of the United States right now. They really aren't responding to the majority desire. Okay. So, yeah, the lady here. Hi, I was wondering, um, with all with the long list of rollbacks and changes, how do we find that information? Is the Trump administration required to report on those changes and rollbacks, or do we learn this information through FOIA requests, or do they announce it themselves because they're blowing their uh, own triumphantly on Twitter? If you want to know the truth, <laughs> you don't have to. You don't have to do that much to find this stuff out, um, you know, because it's boasted about on a on a on a regular basis, and since. This is was just 52. Um, you know, there's one every at least every you know every three three days or so. Um, but who keeps track of it? Our our environmental groups like the uh, NRDC, a group that I like very much is a something that's called uh, Legal Planet. It's a blog that come and I urge you all to get on it. By the way, it's a blog that's put out by the University of California Law School, um, which. Uh, the Bolt Law School, not Bolt, um, the, um, the law school at, at UCLA, which has wonderful environmental lawyers, and the law school at um, UC Berkeley. So they run this little blog and keeping you up to date. On, and it's not just on American or California things, although th those are part of it, but also about the implications more broadly. So it's an excellent website to keep up with on this. But if you go to NRDC or to any of um, the sort of big uh, international um, um, uh, environmental organizations, they'll, they'll have in this information. But also, um, they, there are also things like the New York Times has a climate thing, you know, where they basically collect the climate stories. So there's ways of getting this information. And as I say, they tweet about it with, uh, with glee on a regular basis because they do this once or twice a week. So. Okay. Next question. There's a gentleman there. Yeah. 
Uh, thank you very much. I, I'm curious, is there any indication that even some of the uh, affected industries are hesitant to change their course from the Obama era, seeing Trump as a transient phenomenon and they'll just fall behind in doing what they're going to have to do eventually to modernize and uh, take into account these environmental concerns. I'm hoping there's some, even in some of these industries, they're going to just keep on track as though Trump is, you know, his time will pass and everything is going to come right back, possibly rapidly. Um, I, <laughs> well, I, I, I think that there are quite a few people who are, who are looking at this fire season and hurricane season with a certain amount of dismay. Um, in terms of uh, what various kinds, I, I mean, there are progressive, you know, the, the Mellon family, the Rockefeller family and so on. Those are people whose fortunes are from fossil fuels and then later investment in other things. So they would be perhaps more interested in these kinds of things. You had for a while also um, uh, investment in a broad spectrum so that you would be an energy company, not an oil company. So there are these kinds of things. And we've seen this with um, some of the oil companies based in, in California, which have switched into these sort of big solar farms in the desert and so on. So there, there is a shift. It's just that perhaps the most powerful lobbying institution right now and funding for these more, how shall we say, revanchist kinds of policies would be something like the Koch brothers. And I refer you to um, Jean Meyer's book, Black, uh, Dark Money, which is about the sort of construction of um, the, the climate denialism, but also the politics and, and the structuring of the politics in favor of these oils, old, you know, the dinosaur uh, companies. Okay. Yeah, there's a couple of questions in the back row. So why don't we hear both the questions? All right, All right thanks. Um, so I wanted to know a bit more about the uh, endangered species uh, issue that you mentioned before. This, might, this may sound a bit dramatic, but given the nuclear winter slide that you had, I feel like it's appropriate. So some people say that we're currently experiencing the sixth uh, mass extinction rate. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to know if you share that view, and if yes, if we are in the process of such a mass extinction, do you, do you feel like well, whatever the Trump ad administration does is changing anything about it? And is it actually stoppable given the big time frame that such things have, I believe? Um, and if not, why, uh, why not given the massively enhanced uh, extinction rate of species around the world? Thanks. Um, well, I'm a believer in the sixth extinction, so I, and, uh, and I'm not unique in, in this. Um, so I refer you to the excellent book called The Sixth Extinction, which goes over, goes over she's rather more pessimistic. Uh, part of it is that climate change is going to cause the extinction of lots of creatures that we um, don't even know about. So where this will mostly happen will be in climate changes in the tropics and also associated with tropical development policies, which I didn't even, you know, we don't have to go there just yet. You can take my tropical development course and we'll uh, deal with this. But the other thing is that um, there are part of the, the, we see a lot of extinctions going on in things like tropical coral reefs. Um, which are not things that you sort of, you know, yourself will find um, interesting to, to, you know, you're not likely to know what's going extinct in those systems. So there's a lot of, how shall we say, hidden extinctions and extinctions going on in, in, in oceans that we can't see. In terms of the, um, of the uh, Endangered Species Act, basically what, the, and, and control over hunting, Basically what this was, was a way of keeping habitat in place for endangered animals that are important for long-term ecosystem maintenance. Um, the thing about most natural mortality in animal communities is either the very young or the very old are killed. In hunting, what you want is the most uh, glorious specimen. So you take out sort of the top, the top quality of the gene pool, and, um, and use that as your trophy, um, which you can then post on the internet and everybody can see how great you are. Um, so, uh, but the other thing is if, if you go back to some, uh, like Aldo Leopold's Thinking Like a Mountain, 
what you need is predators to control stuff so that you don't get these um, wild swings in the ecological structure. And also, the, they the enhance resilience within these communities. So part of the problem is that one has to think in an ecosystem way that these are umbrella species, excuse me, umbrella, I'm acting like an umbrella. Um, uh, they're umbrella species rather than just organisms in themselves. So they protect a lot of other things at the same time. So that's why they're important. And also the genetics of them, because they are rare, is you can't, you shouldn't be killing off the best specimens. Um, so there are these kinds of questions as, we're, as well. Okay, let's try and get some more questions in. Do you have the microphone? Yeah. Thank you for the presentation. And since climate change has been very political and there has been fragmentation of international law and climate change, wondering if you have some views on how we can set very universal for uh, universal regulations and standards on carbon reductions and how we can get all the countries together. Well, I think that the response to the withdrawal from the um, from the Paris Accords was one of, well, uh, you know, you're not the only country in the world, and the rest of us can do a lot in terms of de addressing questions of climate change. So, in a certain sense, one of the things, while this is a this is impactful, it's not the only thing that can be done. And the other thing is that if we look at climate change dynamics or CO2 emissions, if you just control the top 12, you've really done a lot. So. The U.S. is out for the moment, but even its own within the states that are um, involved in staying in the in the climate accord, they they they're big parts of the global economy. California being an example. So one of the things is that if you take the sort of club of twelve and really control um, those kinds of things there. Maybe it doesn't matter so much if Burkina Faso doesn't get its um, uh, ducks in a row. So one of the things is to be perhaps more strategic about what are the, the, larger, um, the larger emitters. And also, China has made um, uh, uh, enormous contributions in terms of its shift into uh, both uh, capturing through reforestation and through the use of renewals. So there's a, and, and the European Union is of course particularly strong in this area. So one of the things is that this is, let's hope that this is just an aberration and he isn't around for a long time. Uh, but in the meantime, the other stuff should still go forward. It, there's no reason to go into paralysis just because the United States is revanchiste. Okay, let's try and get two more questions in. There's a chap there, yeah. Hi, um, thank you for the presentation. I was just wondering, um, concerning America particularly, what do you think are the best message um, or the best means of communicating the urgency of these matters to just blue collar or just regular voters? So they know, you know, the, these things are important and they need to vote for people that will, you know, respond effectively. Well, I think uh, nothing is uh, so effective as personal experience, and the South really got nailed um, this year. And uh, and the nor Northern California, you know, that's not all, even though it's the wine growing area, and Glendale is not a, is not, you know, parts of Glendale are fancy, but a lot of it is not. Um, that the going through these kinds of um, experiences of really bad effects of uh, that have been enhanced for sure by climate change is one way of getting people to rethink this. But the other thing is that if you look at the polling data, you'll see that people, you know, two out of three people in the United States believe that climate change is going on. And I think what's going, I, I have uh, I had my house ruined in a uh, in a in an earthquake in California, and you think you know there's that first moment the first month where you're just sort of mopping up and so on, and then you get into the real hall of trying to recuperate 
these things. And it's economically very expensive. FEMA will not cover most of what you have, a lot of what you have to do. You're fighting with insurance people all the time. And um, this is me with a PhD, you know, and I, you know, it's, it takes a lot of time and it takes a lot of mobilization in order to handle these kinds of things. And I think what you're going to see is in Texas, a lot of, and in Florida, a lot of people didn't have flood insurance or the insurance they had didn't cover the kinds of things. What you're going to see is a new kind of, how shall we say, climate migrant, which is not somebody from Somalia fleeing a drought, but somebody from Houston being unable to recuperate their livelihood. And also, it's not just housing that goes away, it's the businesses that go away too. So there's going to be a very strong readjustment, and I think that that's a strong experiential kind of thing about why climate change is important and why one needs to think about it. So I think this year, though horrible in a thousand ways, and really this is gonna have a lot of suffering with it, um, it will be one of these things that causes a reassessment of, of the climate politics in the US. Okay. One final question, if anyone would like to. Uh, gentleman in the middle, there, yeah, your hand up. Uh, thank you. Very fine presentation. Thank you very much for that. I'm a kind of a denier. I'm not really a denier, but I have deniers' um, thoughts. Skepticism. Skepticism, okay. For example, right now I've put in all my LED lights at home, so I'm saving on electricity that way. I have a hybrid car, so I save that way. And then all of a sudden I read in the newspapers that California is on fire. And all the carbon dioxide that I'm saving doesn't count. What do I do about that? Um, well, uh, I think one thing that, I mean, forgive me for this, virtue is its own reward, but uh, so there's that. The other thing is that in these big planetary things, um, this is the great ethical question, which is even if you do everything perfectly, you can't necessarily stop other kinds of dynamics from occurring. Um, that's the problem of global connectivity, which is that you can be doing what you think is best and you won't be able to stop climate change. Um, I recommend a really great book by um, Dale Jameson called Reason in a Dark Time. And it's about the sort of ethics of climate change and its politics. And the problem is that um, it probably doesn't matter what you do if large-scale politics are not moving into place to bend the curve down. But on the other hand, it's not irrelevant to do it either. So you're stuck in a kind of a less than perfect moral position, which is that um, your virtue it does not stop evil in the world. And that is a general position that I think we can all share, you know, if, if only my morality would, uh, you know, would protect the world, but it won't. So in this, what the problem is, we're in a thing that has uh, a great deal of longevity. The CO2 emissions of a century ago are affecting us now. Um, the thing that we were trying to work in the, uh, amongst the Nifty 50 for the climate accords was 10 things that could bend the curve down, keeping it below, um, below two, two degrees centigrade at heating. And some of those, like the methane control, were feasible and possible. Reforesting, forests do a lot of work and they, you, you don't have to invent them. You know, they just, you don't have to invent a machine that takes carbon and turns it into diamonds. You just have trees. Um, so there's, there were a lot of things like that, but at this juncture, what you can see in the rollback is, and, and the, the rollbacks and the contention is that even though these are things that would be easy to do and economically feasible and economically wise, um, they, they are not, they have been overruled by the climate denialism and also the nihilism, I would say, of this particular bunch of people who I don't know why they, I mean, there's economic logic to some degree about their positions, but not in the long term. Can I just also comment on one sure. comment you made before about the impossible impeachment? Mm 
because impeachment will do us nothing at all. First of all, impeachment is only a, a, um, it's a small step towards getting rid of the guy. Yeah, the, what we the, the, really have to consider yeah. is the annulment of the election because of all the interferences that happened during that election time. In Hillary Clinton's book about what happened, she mentions the October 28th FBI revealing stuff, which was so negative. That was that plus well, the Russian and, thing and, and everything and, and all of the other things that were so irregular about the election that well, the election we'll, itself should be annulled. Well, it's unlikely that that will happen. I, yes, I, I know. also with the, the amount of Russian meddling that seems to have occurred through various social media as well as other things, it's, it's very, but that the annulment of the election is unli unlikely to occur. It would, it, it, it's hard to imagine. The impeachment, of course, gives you President Pence, who's yeah, you know, even worse. like a nightmare also. So, yeah. and he's not, you know, he's he's imbricated in all of these things yeah, too. Yeah, but yeah. so that's useless. But he's less he's less charismatic, um, so that's that's helpful. Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, we're we're out of time. Um, I'm sorry for those of you who wanted to ask questions but didn't have time, but thank you to all of you for coming. Thanks yes, for thank those who for asked your questions. Susanna gave you a bunch of ideas for um, further reading if you want to, to follow up on these topics. Another thing that I would suggest you do is have a look at Susanna's center here. You can find that on the Graduate Institute website, the Center for International Environmental Research, and you'll find details about their, their research publication, their research, their publications, and upcoming events that the center is organizing. Please give Susanna a round of applause. Oh. Thank you.